Hello everyone, this is Brad Wistens. I've been looking for a new kind of optimization challenge, and I realized I haven't done a low part count mission yet. I've decided to go big here and go for a low part count grand tour. In this grand tour, I'm going to land on every planet and moon with a surface to land on, and then return home safely to the Kerbal Space Center. And to over-deliver, we're going to go against the normal grain of this channel and have three pilots comfortably housed within a crew module. Since I've got a lot of landings here, I've gone with an ISRU approach, so I'll be able to refuel on each of the landings. And as a result, the total part count came to 10 parts, 4 for the rocket, 1 for the crew module, and 5 for the mining equipment. The actual rocket portion of this consists of a lower stage, which is the largest fuel tank available, and two of the mammoth engines and an upper stage which is just a twin bore engine. Since the twin bore engine contains its own fuel, this means that the top stage is only one part. I'll leave the stage detachment as a mystery for later, and let's focus on the landing. I hadn't tested the vacuum landings very much, and as a result I was very concerned about tipping over on the surface due to the high center of gravity. As this was the first landing, I decided to use all my remaining fuel to try to cancel out any error in horizontal velocity as much as possible. It's still almost tipped over on the surface, which really implied that I'd be having to refine my landing techniques on the subsequent landings. Now that we're on the surface of the moon, we can start mining and get ready to go to our next destination, which will be Duna. Let me talk a little bit about why a five-part mining setup is necessary. First, we need the drill to get the ore out of the surface. Then we need an ore tank to store the ore in, a resource converter to convert it into fuel, and a source of electrical power, which in this case was an RTG. Technically, you could toggle this all off and on really slowly to prevent you from having to need the fifth part, which is a radiator. And there are some tricks using time warp and going to the tracking center where you can sort of get this to work. However, these are really just workarounds to the fact that you're really supposed to and should have a radiator to do mining in this game. As a result, I decided to go with the five-part mining setup, including the radiator, and do this properly. It is now time to do our Duna landing. Duna's atmosphere is very helpful for slowing us down and saving the use of delta-v in doing so, but the air drag also makes it harder to calculate exactly where we're going to land. Since I need to land on a very flat part of land to prevent tipping over, this does provide some difficulties, but I have extra fuel so I can use this to adjust my approach as I come in. Based on what I learned from the moon landing, I'm going to try to land a little bit quicker and prevent myself from even having the time to start slipping around horizontally and risk tipping over. I had previously said that I would never again do a grand tour due to how much time they take. I was able to justify this mission because since it's an ISRU grand tour, there wasn't the same need to optimize every transfer. I've mostly skipped gravity assists with a couple exceptions, and I've also carefully picked a route that will allow me to not have to land on any moon or planet more than once. Take note of how the sequencing of landings in this video lends convenience to the mission. In this case, landing on Duna first allowed me to use the atmosphere to slow down, and now that I'm landing on Ike, I'll already have a lot of gravitational potential energy relative to Duna. Over the next two landings, I'm going to be working my way out to the outer planets, landing first on my favorite destination dress, and then heading out to Jewel to land on Lathe. These transfers are going to start taking a longer elapsed time, and you've also probably noticed by now that the process of mining is taking me a very long time with just the RTG and the smaller converter. I had planned on using the larger converter and a fuel cell, which would allow me to mine orders of magnitude faster, and I did have enough margin to allow the mass of these parts. However, for some reason, the larger converter does not have radial attachment points on it, while the smaller converter does. This was causing problems in putting the craft together properly, which forced me to use the smaller converter. With the smaller converter, a fuel cell can't be used to provide the electrical power because the efficiency of the smaller converter means that you end up using more gas than you're actually getting back out of the mining, which forced me to use the RTG. While I generally avoided gravity assists in this mission, the easy savings in the Joule system were just too tempting. To prevent the use of excessive retro braking to slow down, I used two assists off of Lathe and then one off of Tylo to get me an approach of Lathe at a reasonable speed. The landing on Lathe proved to be quite a bit more difficult than I had expected. 
One of the challenges in landing on lathe is always that you have to aim for the land and there's just not that much of it. I was aiming for an island with a large flat shore area that I hoped would prevent tipping over from being a problem. The flat looking shore area proved to be nowhere near flat. This is a demonstration of what would happen if I went with a straightforward vertical landing here. I knew that the pitch of this slope wasn't so great that the craft couldn't stay when stationary. I tried using just the engine on the south side to gently let that side of the craft down, but this started me to slide across the surface which also caused me to tip over. The solution was to pick up a little bit of horizontal velocity moving north, and then at the last moment before sitting down, to tip over to the south side, which prevented me from rotating once on the surface. The next real milestone in this mission is going to be to land on Tylo, but I can't take off from Lathe and land on Tylo directly, so I'm going to go to Val in between and pick up some more fuel. As mentioned earlier, landing on moons with an atmosphere is easy because it helps you slow down, but it takes more delta V to take off from. Tylo, the heaviest moon with no atmosphere, takes a ton of delta V to land on, so lifting off from Lathe, going directly to Tylo and landing there is not something that we want to do. The landing on Tylo is going to be one of the critical landings here. Because I'm using ISRU to get a single staged anywhere design for most of this mission, I'm really only worried about designing for the hardest segments. The hardest segments are generally getting from Kerbin to Minmus. I actually had some extra so I was able to go to directly to the moon. And the next critical part is being able to land on Tylo. Again, I actually have some extra fuel here which is why I'm able to go directly from Val to Tylo rather than having to go from Bop or Pole to Tylo. While the engineering challenge of having enough Delta V to land on Tylo is quite brutal, actually flying the landing proved to be surprisingly easy compared to the other landings. A big part of what makes a rocket tip when it touches down on the surface is that if the surface is uneven, this puts a torque on the craft which makes it start to rotate. If we have a flat bottom, we'll get corrective torque in the other direction, but this relies on gravity, so what we're really concerned with is the ratio of acceleration due to gravity to the velocity we touch down with. The high gravity on Tylo minimizes the effect of us touching down on the surface with some velocity, and that means that we can touch down at a relatively high speed and still not tip over. Now that we've landed on Tylo, every other planet and moon that we need to get to is going to be easy to do and fairly non-critical. The one big exception is Eve, which is going to dwarf the challenge of everything else in this mission. I'm going to move quickly through the six landings between Tylo and Eve, and as I do so, I'm going to talk about the Keystone Challenge that Eve represents. This mission was originally planned to just be a low part count Eve mission. I started out by trying to minimize the part count of a rocket that could get from Eve surface to Eve orbit. The first design was a one mammoth lower stage, and I Looked at using a twin bore for the upper stage, but that was too massive and it was overwhelming the lower stage. So I tried using a vector engine and fuel tank for the upper stage, and this was able to just barely get to orbit with four parts and had borderline maybe enough delta V to get back to Kerbin, but I realized with four parts that I could add an additional mammoth engine to the bottom stage, reduce the part count by one in the upper stage by switching to the twin bore, and I had a lot more margin to work with. The next step was figuring out how to get this fully filled on the surface of EVE using the least amount of parts. Doing this with staging would be very brutal. The big fuel tank alone weighs 288 tons, and this would quickly lead to a ballooning part count. ISRU only added 5 parts, and as a result was definitely the way to go. As soon as I added ISRU, I realized that this craft had almost everything it needed to be a single staged anywhere design, and with just a little bit of minor moving things around, it was already done. Now that we're at EVE, it's time for the hardest part of this mission in terms of piloting, which is the EVE landing. The first thing I wanted to do was to simplify this as much as possible. So I did some testing and determined some velocities that I had to be under as I went under certain altitudes so I wouldn't have to worry about heating. Next, I made sure that my approach was exactly inclined with the mountaintop that I need to land on so that other than minor adjustments, I would only have to worry about how far my landing approach was going. After determining which speeds I needed to slow down to at which altitudes to avoid overheating, I did several test runs and measured exactly how far the landing run went. Found an average 
and took the best aim that I could. The target area that I needed to land within is extremely small. Not only do I need to land at high altitude on a particular mountaintop, but I need to land on a very particular part of that mountaintop that's actually flat enough for me to stay put on. As a result, despite my extreme caution, the area that would qualify as a successful landing was a lot smaller than the margin of error I could expect from orbit, even with very careful flying. As a result, during the descent, I had to make very careful adjustments to how far I was going and whether I was drifting a little bit to the left or right. It's these kinds of maneuvers that make me really glad that Kerbal Space Program exists. There's no way we could justify doing this kind of thing when human lives are at risk. Luckily, Kerbals are just a much less risk-adverse people than we are. I will admit to some luck in being able to hit the flat portion of the mountaintop dead center, and I also benefited from the stabilizing effect of gravity that I noted on Tylo. While landing on EVE was the biggest challenge in terms of piloting, the ascent from EVE will be the biggest challenge in terms of engineering and Delta V. As opposed to some of the previous takeoffs, I'm going to mine the fuel tanks all the way to full this time. As mentioned near the beginning of this video, one of the challenges here was getting the twin bore stage at the top to decouple without the use of a decoupler that would add an additional part. It doesn't generate enough heat to overheat the large fuel tank, so I've attached the two stages through the resource converter. The resource converter is mounted off-center and directly underneath one of the exhausts of the twin bore, which means that when the twin bore is activated, it'll burn off the resource converter and separate the stages. My program seemed to think that the lower stage was the part that I cared about after decoupling. This was not the case, so I switched back over to the piloted part. The upper stage of this could not be more simple and is comprised of only the two parts that you see, the twin bore engine and the crew module. This has a surprising amount of delta V, which is good because it's going to have to be enough to get our three pilots all the way back home. The easiest way to land this back on Kerbin in terms of delta V would be to get it to low altitude and then just bail out with all three of the pilots and use the EVA chutes to get down to the surface. I've done this in previous videos, so obviously I don't have a problem with it, but I did have some extra margin here, so I've decided to try to use that to take on the challenge of actually landing this upper stage safely. One of the challenges here is that this upper stage is aerodynamically stable in the forward direction and not the reverse direction. We don't want it to be going forward because then it will have less drag and it won't slow down enough, and we also won't be facing the right way when we do want to start retro burning for the final touchdown. Any small deviation from retrograde would call it to uncontrollably flip around despite the stability control. The solution was careful manual adjustments of the pitch control to keep it dead center on retrograde. Finally, to maximize efficiency, Bill and crew played a game of chicken with the ground before firing up the engine. That brings our low part count grand tour, consisting of three Kerbals, 10 parts, and 15 landings to a close. As this is the first low part count mission I've done, please let me know what you thought about it. If there's enough interest, I'm looking at possibly doing a no ISRU low part count EVE mission in the future. Thank you everyone for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.